is amazing. You know, it's, it's the potential for growth, the potential for kind of an inner revolution. And, you know, the field, the more people practice yoga, the more people that are meditating, the greater potential there is for that dream of the planet to be updated. Welcome back, yoga family, to episode number 12 of the Yogi Show podcast. On today's episode, we have the super fun and amazing Kino McGregor on the show. Kino was actually the very first guest we reached out to to be on the show. Like, we didn't even have a show yet, and we were like, we're just going to ask Kino to come on. And, welp, here we are. Kino McGregor is an international Ashtanga yoga teacher, author of three books, entrepreneur, co-owner of the Miami Life Center and owner of the Ohm Stars Network. Yogi Brian and I are so excited to share this fun, inspirational conversation about yoga, mindfulness, and gratitude with many splashes of humor sprinkled throughout. You already know. If you're not already subscribed or following the Yogi Show podcast, please take a hot second to do so now. If you're loving the show, please leave a review. If you're streaming on Apple Podcasts, please, please, please. Hit the share button right now. Put it in your Instagram story. Put it on your Facebook. Put it on your Twitter. We appreciate all your continued support on this podcast journey. Episode number 12 of the Yogi Show podcast is being brought to you by Ohm Stars. Ohm Stars brings you the world's best online yoga and meditation taught by authentic and inspiring teachers. Over 2,000 live and on-demand streaming classes every day just for you. Ohm Stars prides themselves on true inclusivity, yoga for all levels, many different styles from kids yoga to ashtanga, handstands to beginner series, meditation, and even vegan cooking. You can experience the power of Ohm Stars absolutely free for 30 days by going to ohmstars.com and signing up using promo code YOGISHOW. That's all one word. Slap it in caps when you register. Again, that's 30 days of yoga and meditation from the incredible teachers on the Ohm Stars platform using promo code Yogi Show, all one word, at ohmstars.com. Put the Yogi Show in caps. Without further ado, let's jump into today's conversation with Kino McGregor. We will see you on the other side. All right. Thank you so much for being here on the show. Mrs. Kino McGregor, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm so well. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Thank you for being here all the way from the other side of the pond. Where yeah. are you right now? So I'm in Copenhagen. And the reason that I'm here is my husband, Tim, uh, is from Denmark. So even though we live in Miami and our lives are based in Miami and you know, our yoga center is there, we come over at least once a year to spend a bit of time over here in Copenhagen. So now, oh. after, I mean, it almost feels like a second home now after all this time. How cool. How cool. I had I had no idea that that was the case. And because uh, I thought I had seen it before that you went over onto the other side uh, before yeah. on other yeah. Instagram photos and whatnot back in the day. But uh, now I know why. So cool. Brian, what's up, man? Good morning in Arizona. How are you? Good morning, Pedro. Good morning, Kino. Thank you so much for coming on. And we were chatting pre-recording and you're saying it's pretty cold out there right yeah in the last uh, maybe 48 hours the sort of arctic wind from the north has come down and yesterday there were almost hurricane force winds but cold winds and there was a hailstorm last night so it's really starting to feel like winter no thank you no thank you i'm from chicago kino and there's uh we get those we get hail there and such and i'm just i'm just not interested like you know now we you know you and i both live in south florida so i don't the, nobody if, nobody knows what hail is down here if you live down here nobody knows what that is absolutely i mean i've been inside for the last 48 hours <laughs> yeah the only thing that's falling like hail is like ma uh, coconuts from the trees from the palm and trees mangoes. Like, that's the only thing falling down. <laughs> and mangoes <laughs> And mango. Speaking of mangoes, I watched your Instagram live like uh, a month ago or something when you were just cutting endless mangoes. Uh -huh. Where did you find all of those mangoes? We have this really <laughs> big old mango tree in the back of our house and it's such a blessing. It's so just prolific and fertile and such a blessing. So these are all mangoes from our tree. That How many mangoes did you have that day? 
Oh gosh, maybe 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 around a hundred or something like that. <laughs> you know, and we'd probably wow. given another hundred away. Wow. Yeah. Wow, this, this could be a new business venture yeah. for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mango <laughs> McGregor. Yeah. <laughs> Mag- yeah, we're gonna start the Instagram handle right now. Scrap the yoga thing, you know, onto the mangoes. Yeah. We're gonna send mangoes all over the so- world. You know, I do I cut them up. And then we eat a lot of them. We eat a bunch of them. And then we do all sorts of things. So sometimes we make um, like mango jam and then, of course, mango smoothies. We freeze a bunch of mangoes and then I dehydrate them also. So we get a lot of dehydrated mangoes. And so, I mean, it's just mango Delicious. madness. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mango bad. We're, yeah, that's the Instagram name. Mango badness. I love it. Ha- hashtag mango madness. Yeah. <laughs> next yoga challenge. <laughs> yeah, the next yoga challenge, Kino. <laughs> the Ohm Stars challenge. Mango madness. Oh How many gosh, so fun. can you eat in a day? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So cool. Thank you for being here. I mean, this has been so fun. And I know that um, you have so much value to add to um, that you've already added to the yoga community over the years and all you know, in your, your center down in Miami and on Instagram. And uh, you in, have influenced me a lot um, as a meme maker um, over the past four years or so. Just watching you grow um, just on Instagram platform. I didn't know you before then. And just being able to to see the evolution of your practice and all the things that you've done and um, has really been inspiring. So, thank you for that. Oh, and I actually you. made a meme of you. You're welcome. I made a meme of you um, back. I just literally thought about this right this second in October of 2015. It was during the hashtag Basic Yoga Mix. Huh? Um, uh, I don't know if you remember that. One. I mean, was, uh, you've done a lot, but anyway, so I made a, a funny meme of you, and you commented on the post like a smiley face or something, and it yeah. I, it warmed my heart so much that you commented something on the post. So thank you for taking the time back in the day. You know, oh, you're very welcome. I do remember that challenge, and I do remember the I do remember commenting on a meme. I thought it was really cool. I mean, I I think humor <laughs> is just such an important part of of real of life, and I feel like this is something that a lot of yogis get real serious and real rigid about and so I really love I really love the you know the interjection of humor into what is you know really a a, a quite dedicated and sometimes very intense spiritual practice totally and it can people some people take it so serious all like all the time and um you know Brian and I we talked about this before that we take our practice serious but in the end, like Brian's motto in life, Brian, tell the motto in life. Tell everybody the motto in life, you know. So, so my motto, and it's, it's a paradox. So my motto is it's just fucking yoga. It's just fucking life. And it's just like I take my yoga practice seriously, but then I have to reel myself back in daily to be like, okay, it's just yoga. Like I can't take it seriously, especially, you know, I'm a, I'm a newer yoga teacher. I've, I've been teaching for a little over two years now. And just just within those two years, there's a lot of struggles. I mean, you work for a studio and then, you know, there's there's numbers that, that you get stressed out about and, you know, numbers ebb and flow. So there, mm-hmm. there's, you know, some days I feel the great energy and the class numbers are awesome. And then maybe the next week the class numbers are down. It's like, you know, I have to just be consistent with my practice and just not take it as seriously. I'm just up there, you know, guiding people, sharing my practice. Well, I, I really, I really respect the- that. Yeah, connect with that a lot because I feel like what can, you know, what can happen is there's this part of the mind that wants to create structure and create something that's very known and very certain. So, you know, both to practice yoga every day is to really be willing to face uncertainty. And then to be a yoga teacher, like as you mentioned, that ebb and flow, you can easily think that you can control the outcomes. But in reality, there's no control. Some classes will be really packed and some classes will be really empty. And in the same sense, some things that you're really, really excited about and you think are going to connect with so many people are just a flop. And something else that you're like, I don't even know if I should teach this today. People really, really respond to. Yep, they do. And it's 100%. When you challenge them and when you just show up and just say, okay, this is the energy in the room and this is what uh, this is what we're going to go with today. Like there's like a a baseline for me anyway there's like a base of what i'm going to instruct and then sometimes it goes higher or it goes a little slower depending on the energy in the class and that's so key is like being in tune with the frequency and the energy in the room like that's awareness like that's yoga yes. like that is yoga I, I, oh absolutely you know and i i think that even in terms of 
evolution of, of, of consciousness that I've gone through as a person. I think when I first started teaching, I was very much interested in what I thought was cool. You know, what I was really interested in teaching. And then I feel as like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, wow, this is really like, check out this cool arm balance. And I thought it was really cool, but I've really, really just changed my focus entirely. So that what inspires me now is no longer centering myself, but what inspires me is really centering the students to kind of show up. Yes. And as you tune into the the energy of the room, the people, the human beings that are in front of you and just like ask the question, you know, what do they need? How can I serve? Yes. Saber. Absolutely. All all about Saber. And how did you, so obviously you've been teaching for, how long have you been teaching for? Um, I mean, probably something like 19 years. Wow. That's amazing. And going strong and just absolutely killing it. Um, absolutely amazing and inspiring. How did you find teaching? Like when you started doing yoga, were you like, I'm going to teach? Like, is this something that I wanted to do or or just how did that start? Yeah, no, um, I never thought that I would be a yoga teacher. You know, I started practicing yoga. I mean, I did my first class when I was 19 and then I kind of just dabbled around, you know, as I think everybody does when you drop into a class and you think it's interesting, then you know, you drop into another class here and there, maybe you buy a book about yoga. And nowadays we do, you know, videos uh, about yoga in our home and we, and we, you know, dabble on things. So I did that until I was um, 22. So for like three years, I was kind of like a self-taught yogi. And then Mm -hmm. I went into, you know, a, a, a practice and it was in the practice of Ashtanga yoga that I, I started coming to my mat six days a week. You know, I traveled to India and then it was when I came back from India and I'd been practicing yoga for about a year that every, every place I went, people started asking me um, to teach them. And I remember feeling entirely inadequate and that I, you know, I wasn't a yoga teacher and all I would do in circumstances, like I would get a massage at the end of the massage, the massage therapist therapist would say, what do you do? You must do something physical. And I would say, well, I do yoga, (laughs) you know, India to study yoga. And then they would say, well, can you teach me whatever style of yoga that you do? And, you know, and and I would say, you know, I'm not a teacher. And I would have like all these names of teachers. I was living in New York City at the time, just amazing other Ah. teachers that I would try to send people to. And they ended up really, really pushing me and saying, no, we really like, we, I like your energy and I'd really like to learn from you. And I remember the massage therapist was like, do you want to just trade massages? Well, I couldn't say no to that. You know, I, uh, Oh, definitely not. (laughs) Sign me up. (laughs) Right. Exactly. But that's how I started teaching was just people talking to people. I was working as a freelance journalist in New York city and getting my graduate degree. And I would interview people for like articles that I was working on. And then at the end of the article, you know, I remember this one time I was working on an article about the garbage situation in Manhattan. And there was this whole question of, you know, I mean, if you've ever been to New York, they're like garbage days are really conspicuous because there are these big black garbage bags that line the sidewalks. And there was this whole question of, you know, what does garbage in Gotham say about the city? And so I was researching that. And anyhow, everybody, almost everybody I interviewed for that article, I would turn the recorder off and then they would say to me, so are you really a journalist? And I remember thinking, like, <laughs> this imposter syndrome, like I'm, I mean, like I'm 23, like I'm not a journalist, but I kind of want to be. And then I would say, well, why do you, you know, why do you ask? And they just would say, I remember the conversation again and again, you just seem a little different. Do you do anything other than journalism? And then I would start talking about mm-hmm. yoga. Oh, well, I do this yoga thing. And I went to India, yeah. I studied in India. Oh, wow. Could you come teach me that? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, like, no. There's like thousands yeah. of teachers better qualified than I am in New York. So I just started teaching like that because some uh, the people that wouldn't say no, uh, they, I ended up teaching them privately in their living rooms and taking no money and just doing exchanges because I didn't feel that I was qualified and just continuing my practice. And it just evolved from there. I know that feeling of not feeling qualified enough and just like it's just my practice and I'm not sure about sharing it or like you know the value of like what my time is worth kind of thing you know and like I don't know if I can uh, let's just trade something like don't pay me any money because then I have to feel like then I'm actually like the teacher I, I know what that's like and it's amazing that you recognize that and you did that and then when was the invitation for you to like a studio is like no you need to come here and teach like at my place like when did that was that shortly thereafter no, actually, it was a good while after. I think that um, that didn't really happen for me until I left New York City. And I was back. And my, my, my goal was 
let me save enough money so that I can go to India for six months. That was really kind of like my, I wanted to go for six months. I wanted to immerse myself in everything about the sort of traditional practice in India. And I, mm -hmm. when I moved back to Miami, I also made, you know, the, 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 the very privileged decision to go back and live with my parents because I could, you know, not everybody's parents yeah. can welcome them back into their family home. But my parents were able to give me back my childhood bedroom, which I, you know, happily took <laughs> in. And so I didn't have oh, yeah. Room. And then that's the time when, you know, I would go back to the studios around Miami and, and that's the place where I was really like, okay, I, I'm not, I, I was still working as a freelance journalist, but that was the point where I was like, okay, I think that I should probably go and teach now that I was teaching individual people privately in New York City. I felt like, let me go around to the spas, the gyms and all of the different places in Miami. And that's kind of when I made the commitment to, okay, let me teach yoga. And my, my reasoning for how I made that okay for myself was that I was going to teach in an effort to go back and continue my studies. And that's what I told everyone. I want to just teach for a little bit. Maybe you can put me on the sub list because my intention is, you know, to go back to India, you know, with it for, and stay for six months. So this is a way for you to help fund my continuing education kind of thing. And, yeah. and you know, very, very slowly, I did manage to accumulate some classes, but I had this problem, which many new teachers have, which is I said yes to everything and I wasn't discriminating. So I think it's- And there. Yeah. I, I was driving around Miami and like the whole of Miami, all the way from, you know, way down south in Palmetto Bay, all the way to Key Biscayne and then even up <sighs> to Fort Lauderdale. So I was just like- I was huge That's like a three hour drive. <laughs> Yeah. And then I would like stop over here in Coconut Grove and teach a class and then go over to Key Biscayne and teach a class, drive over to Miami Beach and teach a class and then go back to Coconut Grove, drive up to Fort Lauderdale and then drive all the way back to Palmetto Bay. And it was just like, so for people that aren't familiar with Miami, that's like huge distances. Each of those in a best case scenario is like a 30 minute drive, you know? best case scenario <laughs> right <laughs> yeah best yeah and i was doing i think something like like 20 more than 20 classes a week and i was really really exhausted and tired but i just kept on thinking i'm just saving money to go back to india that had i had a target amount of money that i needed to save and you know thanks to my parents not you know not not needing me to pay any rent and definitely feeding me a lot uh, you know and i was really able to save yeah. enough money to go back to india for six months and i was able also to go to Nepal on as well because it was right nearby was something I wanted to do and that's a pattern that I kind of established and I would work for like approximately six months teaching wherever I could teach and then I would go back to India for another six months and that's kind of was really the beginning of my commitment to the practice of yoga and I guess also the teaching yeah that's and when you were in India like obviously you went like the first time you went how long were you there my first trip was two months okay and then you were like, I need more. So Absolutely. you want to go back and you did six. Yeah. And then do you still visit there regularly now? Is that still like part of your repertoire for like continuing education or just to go visit? Like, have you done that over the years? Because clearly you enjoy going to India. Oh, I love India. And I love uh, everything that India has to teach the yoga student or someone on a spiritual path, I think is so, so valuable. If we look at the spiritual traditions of India, we have both Buddhism and, you know, the, the spiritual tradition of Hinduism both really uh, coming and originating from the Indian subcontinent. So this is the home of so much inner work that I feel that really everyone on a spiritual journey, people that are practitioners of, you know, Buddhist meditation or, you know, the yoga path, I think trips to India, whether you have one teacher or whether you just visit and perhaps go to some sacred sites, like there's an immense amount of teaching, you know, that's there. So for me, I just wanted to continue to go back and study. And, you know, when I went to India, it was like 20 years ago and it was a different yeah. world, like India before the internet had arrived, before people had <laughs> cell phones, there were no cell phones, literally no one had any yeah. cell phones when I first went there and th nobody had landlines. So you had to like hotels did and a few people in each neighborhood did. But if you wanted to make a phone call, you had to, you know, go into a little booth and like, it wasn't, you wouldn't put quarters or anything like that. And you would just call and then you'd have to pay, you know, pay the fee after. It's just, it was a, such, such a different world. And I'm so, so grateful for that immersive experience. And so what I feel like was so powerful about it is the idea of going to a place in time 
where the essence of a traditional practice or a different sensibility remains uh, remains untouched you know and that's something that i'm so so grateful for like you could say something of the old world something of a time uh you know gone by something of the past of our of our yeah. spiritual heritage that you know now we're very very divorced from and it was such such a blessing to go back and 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 and, and live in a different way and and be in a different way and just let that experience change me and change the quality of the minds and you know one thing that i usually say about about that experience of of going to india is it's like each it, it felt for me like each leg of the trip and each month i stayed there all of the known asset aspects of my personality the known universe of my thoughts just sort of crumbled and it was like the longer just keep I, changing yeah exactly and like the longer i stayed there the more i was able to sort of step into the unknown to become a potentially new person to evolve to grow and to not be bound by you know the, the the momentum of the identity that i was born into and raised into and the expectations placed on you know the average citizen of the united states right absolutely and you're in a you're in a different country and a different a totally different mindset and culture uh like mm-hmm. way different than obviously new york or miami um, cl- clearly, <laughs> and when you're there, when and, you know when you're immersed in that kind of setting, um, it's way beyond the physical practice. You know, it's it's way it's way beyond that in that culture. So when you started going there, obviously you did a lot of Ashtanga yoga. That was that's your thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but did you get introduced? Is that where you were introduced? To like you know, vipassana or meditation, all that stuff. Like all did, did all that come from India. Um, absolutely. So, you know, I, I continue to go back to India every chance that I get. Um, mm-hmm. I was going still every year for many, many years. And uh, I was I, I was even there this January and practicing for a month in January. So, you know, I, I think Beautiful. it's such a blessing to be a student and I never want to yeah. lose that, you know, and it was it was. Right. Yeah. So for me in, in India, I've gone to do the physical practice of Ashtanga yoga, as well as sort of chanting and Sanskrit studies with some local professors mm-hmm. who are really, really amazing in the Mysore area. And then this was the place where I first got exposed to uh, different types of meditation. There's also, you know, other spiritual lineages within India, um, whether that's Vedic sure. studies or, you know, this, the kind of, you know, spiritual rebel that everybody now knows as Osho. There's an Osho center in Mysore as well. Uh, and, okay. You know, and then in-, in Spiritual yeah. rebel. I loved how you said that. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Oh and and so it was also in India that I found, you know, that I first got introduced to the Vipassana, you know, the Vipassana practice. And that after my six months in India, then it, then I did my first Vipassana retreat, but I, I did that in Nepal. Um, you know, so that was kind of, for me, it's very much the epicenter of these, these sort of the inner traditions of the East. And again, I just think it's extremely important for practitioners, particularly teachers who really, who really want to kind of communicate the the practice to, to at least go once and experience sort of the origins. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the journey to Mecca, right? For every Muslim, it's maybe you don't go every right. year, but at least at least once and immerse yourself at least go yeah that i really strongly believe that experience it Mm -hmm. yeah and from from the all our guests that we've had on there's like a common theme which which especially for the new yoga teacher out there the the common theme is like practice yoga and really things just start falling into place like just from your story you know you you it was a personal practice for you 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 wanted to set on an, on a journal a journalist you know career but it's like your yoga practice took you you know the deeper you got into your practice the you know the more you can help people yeah helping 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 yeah for sure do you do uh vipassana regularly kino yeah, I sit. I have a sitting practice that I do every day, and mm. as I go, I feel I, I you know, that I, it's hard to explain, but I feel that the asana practice is amazing and powerful, and in some ways entertaining because you know you're, you're right. there's like always something like you're trying this and you're trying that, and then you're trying to do a handstand or you're trying to do a headstand right. or you're trying to do a forward stand. It's like always something going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I uh, that, yes. <laughs> You know, the tool of that is wonderful because if you have if you have 
someone that is as you could say, removed from the body or disembodied is very, very caught in the web of thoughts. Being hyper-engaged in movement like that gives a wonderful opportunity to become re-embodied and immersed in that field of the body. And and I very much needed that in the beginning of my mm-hmm. spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. But then I think once you're embodied, then it's extremely interesting to kind of drop down to an even deeper level and kind of work with the thoughts as thoughts. And this is, you know, in the in the Buddhist tradition, this is uh, when we have uh, vipassana. Then we have, um, you know, the idea of being able to be aware of of the contents of the mind as the thoughts, the quality of the thoughts, the emotions, the the feelings and sensations of the body, and being and being sort of deeply aware of the the inner sensibilities. And so, so for me, I just really meditation has helped me stabilize the mind and 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 enter and access deeply seated and, and rooted subconscious patterns and bring those up to the surface and and not that and i feel that it's a really really important compliment for me with the physical asana practice and i have this commitment that i've made with myself over the last over the last year which is that as much time as i spend in asana practice i will spend seated in meditation as well because i really Ooh. see the benefit it's difficult, right? When you think about that. But again, awesome. <laughs> yeah. right? You're like, yeah, so I'm going to do headstand. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Or I'm going to sit for an hour. I mean, the idea of sitting for an hour for someone that's newer to the spiritual path just sounds like a form of torture. So, you know, I mean, I, yes. I built up to sitting over, over, over like a 19 year meditation practice. So I like people that are just starting off on the meditation journey or people that are overwhelmed with their thoughts. I always say five minutes a day, like just sit for five minutes a day. That's all you have to do. And then that's a really easy beginning. That's where I started 19 years ago. And here I am and I sit now for an hour in the morning. And then I sit again before bed because I really find it helps me sleep. I don't always get to an hour again in the evening, but I do try. They say that five minutes is the minimum amount of time to make a like a difference in the quality of your thoughts to to experience a palpable shift in the mental state and so I, I, if I if ever I you know I always sit a minimum for five minutes but they say that it's 20 minutes for the mind to reach the sort of subconscious processing level so I really strive to to, to you know try to make every ta- every meditation be 20 minutes but it does it honestly doesn't always get there that I do sit I do I am pretty diligent about one hour in the morning before the asana practice and then in the evening I try to remember how long was my asana practice and how long do I have to sit for it to keep my commitment. <laughs> yeah that is that is important and that is something I can totally relate to you because I started my practice and I, I just wanted the physical benefits. I started a, a, a consistent practice back in 2016. And just recently, I mean, I get my, I used to get my meditation like in the end and Shavasana, you know, for, for that meditation. But lately in February, I was like, I'm going to start a meditation practice because I know there's something deeper in my yoga practice. So in February, I committed to 90 days. I used insight timer and, mm-hmm. and I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to sit through it. Maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, just 90 days. Cause I know, I know at day like 60, that's when a shift changes in your brain. That's when a habit starts forming. Mm-hmm. So I committed to that 90 days. The, the first 30 days, it was hard to sit for five to 10 minutes. It was torture. Yeah. And then it just gradually built up 60 days was 20 minutes. And then 30 days was 30 minutes. And then it was, it was a month ago. I told myself I'm going to sit for the hour. Yeah. And that was, Felt like four hours. I can totally relate to what you say. It was so like, I wanted to get out of it. I wanted to check my phone. I wanted to go on Instagram. I wanted to do something else. Anything else. I'm like, why? Yeah, why do I want to do something else? Like, and, and then I kept asking myself, I'm like, why do I want to do that? Oh, just to not sit here. And that, that's where the breakthrough really happened to me. So, yeah, yeah. anyone out there listening, just sit five minutes. Yeah. Sit down. You know? We start there. You can really, really start there. So if you've ever thought about joining a Vipassana, Vipassana meditation retreats are in the style of, you know, SN Goenka are t- entirely donation based all over the world. And I've, there's a, probably a center nearby you, nearby anyone who's listening right now. And the website's dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. And I just should mention that because, again, 
you know, sometimes yoga classes can be expensive, even meditation retreats are expensive to travel to, but this organization is really entirely donation based and it's really, really such a blessing. And, you know, as you mentioned, to sit for an hour, if it can feel like four hours, I feel that every time I've gone in and done a, a Vipassana meditation retreat, I feel like one day is kind of like almost a year's worth of life learning. You know, wow. Wow. I'm stopped wow. in a way that is just, you, we can't sense it because what do we do? There's always something to do. Even if you're not looking at your phone, there's laundry to do and kids to take care of and the bed to be made and shopping to be right. done and cooking for dinner and all this kind of stuff that we go around and do and our work and emails. And well, I'm not on Instagram, so let me organize my closet. And you know, so, <laughs> right. so anything else, yes. something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's always something to do. You know, it's so funny. Uh, just the name of the center that you just said, um, can you say it one more time? I don't want to, I don't want to butcher the name. Can you say it again? It's Dhamma. So it's, the, it's, it's Vipassana, but it's Dhamma. So it's just like Dharma, but without the R. Yeah. So Dhamma. No, like the, uh, the go, Goinka. No, like the Goinka. Yes, yes. Yes. So his, so the, the, found, the sort of, he's not the founder, but he's really the one that sort of popularized this tradition. And uh, his name is Esther Goenka. G-O-E-N-K-A. Goenka. Okay. Uh-huh. That's the same one. I was just trying to resonate in my brain. We had, we had a conversation with Brian Kest and uh, uh-huh. he was talking about that he goes there and cause donation based. And that's kind of like what started him doing donation based classes and all that stuff in LA. And um, so it's just interesting that you just brought up the same center uh or one of you know one of the centers um mm-hmm. like that, it, that you know it just makes all the synchronies in the uni- synchronicities just kind of come come back home to me i don't know it was just amazing that you said that and that you have that practice and that awareness to do that i've challenged myself to start a sitting practice uh, more consistently and um listeners out there like it's it's not easy but the, i can feel the shift i did it yesterday i woke up 10 minutes before my alarm uh, before my workout and I was like, you know what? Why am I going to lay back down here? I just woke up and looked at my phone. Like, why am I going to lay back down for like 10 minutes? Why don't I sit here in a seated meditation, like go on my floor, just sit there for 10 minutes and then start my day, my workout, everything from there. I felt so clear, so clear just from those 10 minutes, getting into my day and my workout and everything I needed to do. It was amazing just to be able yeah. to center. So that, And that's an amazing thing to establish as a ritual. So I would say for for people that are looking to start yoga and meditation, particularly as home practitioners or new practitioners, the sheer momentum of the established patterns that are the rituals of our life are very, very hard to change. So we all have these patterns. We get up in the morning, we check our phone, the phone is the alarm. So we have to turn the alarm off. Then the news, Mm -hmm. the news notifications are there. (laughs) Right. no, all the likes, all the comments. <laughs> yeah, totally. They're all there. We turn off the phone. We read the comments as we're going to the bathroom. Then we brush the teeth, and then you know. But and then it's like, well, but then the day starts to have this momentum. So to break that and then say, now I'm going to go sit. Now I'm going to go do yoga. I'm going to unroll my mat. Is really really difficult. So to claim those five minutes is like a bold step into the uncharted territories of a potential new you. And yes. it requires courage and determination. And it's something that I, you know, if, if you, if you have this spark inside of you, you can really do it, you know, it's possible for everyone. Oh, no doubt. You have it. it you have it within you. And, you know, in your mentioning home practice, it's like, a lot of time back in the day, um, there wasn't YouTube, you know, there wasn't Instagram TV, there wasn't all these um, networks that have amazing practices and classes available. And I'd love to dive into a little bit of Ohm Stars because I know that's your network, and we could talk about mm-hmm. that um, to give a little bit uh, listeners a little bit of insight on what that is and what you've created. But back in the day, that wasn't available to anyone, so you really had to like either learn from a yeah. teacher, learn from a book, and then figure it out. But now there's yeah. all these ways to do it. So I know you've created Ohm Stars. So if you could talk a little bit about Ohm Stars and uh, maybe your mission behind it and how obviously you're helping a lot of people around the world that maybe just can't get to a studio but want a high quality experience from the comfort of their home and don't have an hour. Maybe they have 10, 20 minutes. You know, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that and, and what you've done with that? Well, Ohm Stars was born out of a sincere desire to provide yoga classes, support for home practice, and also inspirational stories about what yoga is for Mm -hmm. people all over the world. 
world. And this kind of came to me one day, actually, when I was sitting here in Copenhagen and it was a rainy, cold day and I was looking, I was flipping around on Netflix and I was like, you know, I'm really not into any of this content. It no longer speaks to me based on the paradigm that I operate within now. There were all of these drama based, you know, reality shows and these kind of yeah. two dimensional and I just thought I can't like it's nothing I can watch anymore I actually can't watch anything on television and I just had this this idea that popped into my mind that there must be other yogis like me sitting around being unsatisfied with what's available online looking for something to inspire them to practice whether it was a story about a day in the life of a yogi or a class that they could put on when they didn't mm -hmm. feel that they had the motivation to get on their mat and so that was where Om Stars came from the idea to bring like-minded people all around the world together to tell the story of yoga and to support the personal to, to, to support people's personal practice and that dream is really true i mean every day i get a message from someone that says you know i can't afford to go to yoga class every day but i can't afford you know a monthly membership so i put on you know i put on the videos on om stars and i let that guide my practice then then i hear from someone that says you know i lost the inspiration to practice but i just joined your yoga challenge which came with you know a free month of om stars and you know i watched yeah. three videos and I'm back on my mat after 12 months off. And I just like, every time I read a message like that, oh. I just really, yeah, I feel like I got chills. Yeah, I got chills thinking about getting that message, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thinking about you getting that message gave me chills because on these platforms that we run with uh, the memes and like funny content that we create and a little different, obviously than teaching on the internet, but even with starting this podcast, when someone sends reshares a story or sends a message like, Oh my gosh, this conversation was so inspiring. I learned blank and blank. And uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. It's like, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, like Brian and I, yeah. we're not making, you know, like we're not making millions of dollars from this podcast yet, but, <laughs> but the point is that that's not what it's for. You know, it's for service. It's for creating somewhere, a safe place and a community of people that can come together over something that they, um, they have passion for and can get inspired, you know, to, can really get inspired and um, amazing that you've created that network. I actually have friends that are on OMSTARS. So my friend Lexi Hidalgo did the kids videos. Oh, awesome. for, so I I was I was here locally in Delray and her mom texted me and said, Hey, um, you have these yoga masks that you wanted to use for the this video shoot. Like can you bring them like right now over to the studio? And so I went there and like the whole crew was in there filming. It was really cool. Like I watched them. Hello, yogis. It's Yogi Brian just chiming in here on the Yogi Show because I know y'all like trivia. So we're going to do a special trivia here on the Yogi Show podcast. Just one question. Just one question. Chill out. Just one question. No cheating. No Googling. No going on your phone to find this answer. I'm going to give you the answer at the end of the show. Let's see if you can get the answer to this question. So... What is the biggest island in the world? That's the question. What is the biggest island in the entire world? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer at the end of the show. And I also want to let you know about omstars.com. That's O-M-S-T-A-R-S.com. What OMSTARS is, it brings you the world's best online yoga and meditation taught by authentic and inspiring teachers. Over 2,000 classes on OMSTARS. 2,000 classes, that's 2000. Wow. On demand, streaming every day just for you, just for your grandma, just for your grandpa, just for your kids, maybe even your dog. I don't know, but check it out. OMSTARS.com. And look, if you put in yogi show or the code that's y-o-g-i-s-h-o-w that code gets you a 30-day trial yogi show is your code check out home stars check it out yogis and yeah wait for that trivia before the show see if you got it right now let's get back to the show it was it was really really cool so uh it, i love our it, team you know there this is home stars is really made possible because there are so many other people that believe in the dream including our awesome our awesome you know productions team in miami and our yeah. you know the, there's this other side to, you know, telling the story, which is that we're also a technology platform. So right. there's, we've got 
really amazing tech team that's constantly updating and upgrading. And you know, we're we're in the middle of some really big upgrades. We're developing a mobile app right now, so we're only a desktop interface. And it's mobile responsive. And you know, you know, if you if you're tech savvy, you know how to make that function like an app. But then we're actually in this process of you know developing an app that would be on be able on on you know Android and and an iOS app. So so that's a really really exciting Congrats. next development. Yeah. That's congratulations on that because you're right. Everything's on the phone, you know, and you can make your the desktop part make it work on a mobile. But when it's more mobile friendly, you already know that's why you're creating it. You know, it's more user exactly. friendly, and that and that helps everybody. But totally. obviously, you you didn't get to Ohm Stars and that creation of that without building your you know kind of your personal brand and your 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 platforms along the way. I mean, your YouTube channel was created you know back in the day um you know and it has amazing videos and content on there was that when you started doing that and then you started doing videos online you know like how did that all start from you know what was like the first moment where you're like i could do this on a on like an internet platform instead of like everybody has to come to a yoga studio or everybody has to come to my event in copenhagen or wherever you are in the world like when was that shift in your mindset of like i can do this all from like a digital like a digital interface well, I guess it kind of happened in its own, you know, its own way. You know, as you mentioned before, that the the universe really presents opportunities to you when you get in alignment with what that potential totally. sort of future self might be. Yes. So, you know, I would put like people would take videos of me often when I was traveling, and then they would post it on YouTube. And I was just really at first, I was just really excited that there was a hundred thousand views or something like that. And then, <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> I could make a channel. I was just happy that like some, you know, that I was on YouTube, you know, at all. And yep. then, and then eHow contacted me and asked me to be a yoga expert on their YouTube channel. Then the, the, oh. they said, the, yeah, so I was like, okay, sure. Like, what's that? And, you know, they paid me not very much, you know, but, yeah. um, you know, then I thought it was a good opportunity. And then the, 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 the day that I filmed the guy who they sent to film the filmmaker, he said to me, wow, you're really good at this. Like, do you have your own YouTube channel? And I was like, no, I do not. And he said, you know, you should really make one. I'll, I, you know, you could pay me to make the videos and we can just remove eHow. And I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, let's cut them yeah. out of the middle and then I get all the money. Come on, Kino, let's go. Yeah. Like <laughs> that sounds like a good idea because who's eHow? Then I own the videos and okay, so let's yeah. do that tomorrow. You know? <laughs> you know? So then I started doing that and then and then there were other online channels that were kind of, you know, run as businesses owned by corporations, some, you know, venture capital funded that, you know, reached out to me. And I, you know, in my naivete, I really was like, oh, sure. Again, I, I had the same attitude of like, wow, I'm so happy that someone like wants my videos on there. And it really took, again, like a little while for me to really think, wow, this could be really awesome for me to do this myself, not just for my videos. See, what, what was always really the heart of Omsars was to tell the whole inclusive story of yoga far beyond only me and to have that story be told by yogis for yogis, to have the bottom line be about the spreading of the message of yoga, not, mm -hmm. you know, not be about how can we maximize corporate profits to, you know, pay our venture capital investors. Omsars is entirely me. It's totally bootstrapped. The only funding we got was from the amazing backers that we had on Kickstarter otherwise it's right. just me and like all my life savings that i've poured into it to yeah. make it you know what it is and so that's feeding really one the boat and then it goes you yeah know? it's really important for me because as soon as you have you know venture capital investors and private equity investors then they're driving the ship based on the maximization of corporate profits and the payment out of dividends and you know i i i actually feel really really passionate about having having a company whose ethos and and bottom line is not is not the maximization of profitability of course we want to be profitable of course we want to be able to pay our staff and our teachers really well and yes. deliver an awesome service but our our bottom line is how many people do we serve how many people mm -hmm. do we serve how many we do in the world how how can we how can we tell the story of yoga so that more people can practice so there's real inclusivity not token inclusivity real inclusivity and real accessibility yeah making it accessible for everyone with all different styles of classes and everything that you're offering is amazing you know that's that's so cool that you're able to be able to uh, to do that and hold the space for everyone in a safe place you know in a safe place is is amazing yeah. 
and when you when you took it there and you started to create this thing and you and you're doing this, um, <clears throat> Instagram obviously that's that's how I found you was on Instagram, yeah. you know. And I have I went you know it's so funny I, I pull up your Instagram I scroll all the way to the bottom, <laughs> all the yeah. way down there. There were so many beautiful pictures of flowers, like yeah. there's just flowers everywhere, <laughs> you know. So when you started your Instagram, it was like like flowers and, and beautiful pictures there was a the, the first post was uh like a picture of you getting your hair done were you filming videos for that do you remember what that is from it's like 2012 like june of 2012 you know, i think i may have been doing youtube pedro's a stalker you know I'm, a, I'm not a stalker i'm not a stalker i was just curious <laughs> what happened back in the day on instagram that's a nice way of just saying you're a stalker pedro <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, and then there there are people who have been following me on Instagram since the kind of beginning of my Instagram, which I find really, really powerful. So there'll be people who who will say something like, I'm with you from since the flower days. And so like oh, I okay. my, Yeah. I didn't think it was gonna be like this huge, gigantic platform. I thought it mm-hmm. I was really just like Instagram's a place to share images that you think are beautiful. And so I love flowers and I love sunsets and I, you know, so I was just literally just when I saw something that I thought was really pretty, I would take a picture of it and share it again, centering myself in my own experience. Whereas mm-hmm. now you know, what I've shifted towards is how can I teach? How can I serve? Here's a community of people, of yoga practitioners around the world. And what kind of content do I want to post that would be in service of them? And so yeah, that's added. really, that's been the shift. Yeah. Adding the value, you know, how can I add the value to somebody's life and serve? That's so cool. And when you like, obviously you went through the phase, like I think Instagram went through the phase of like, there was like lots of yoga challenges back when I first yeah. got on it, you know, four years ago, like yoga challenges was like, that was life. Like yoga challenge was life. Everything, <laughs> like everything was revolved uh, like around that. And uh, is that how you really built the the follower base and the community that you're that you have on your platform was through the uh, yoga challenges? I think the yoga challenges were a really really amazing way, and still are a really really amazing way to keep uh, mm-hmm. a community of people all over the world engaged around you know practicing every day. There's great kind of peer support of people commenting on each other's posts and keeping everyone motivated. So I'm you know I still run yoga challenges. We just finished one. There are a couple of things that we've really that I've kind of updated to make the challenges more like I feel even in more service. So like I would say that in the beginning it was just again like wow this is cool hey let's post a challenge oh awesome and it was just you know really really just you know just kind of fun and 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 inspiring to see so many people post and we had no real way to figure out how many people are participating in the challenge just how many people use the hashtag well i can't remember when but maybe like three years ago or maybe maybe three and a half years ago i had an idea that hey maybe we could track how many people are doing the challenge and get some sort of sponsorship so that we could do yoga challenges for charity or we could provide video support for each yoga challenge so that, you know, sometimes I would see people posting a picture and it was clear that they didn't have a practice to support the challenge post. They would just take a picture somewhere randomly. And I really got the <laughs> sense of hey, like what I want is not people to just photograph a picture real quick. I want people to do a practice. So again, how can we serve? How can we have the practices that people can access to, to have them, you know, practice through the video and then take a picture and actually support the establishment of that new habit pattern of I get on my mat every day. And, and that's kind of where they've evolved. And then the charity challenges are really, really powerful. I, I, I can't, I don't remember the number, but I think it's something like close to $40,000 that we've raised for different charities. Wow. Through the that's yoga so wow. Amazing. Mm-hmm. It's really powerful. And there's been some amazing charities. Like we, I think last year we, it was last year we did a challenge with One Prosper and were able to donate, I think close to, I don't know, it was, it was five or $7,000 to provide uh, a clean water for rural villages in Nepal and in uh, Northern India. And that was really, really powerful. In, and then we've done, you know, charity charity challenges where we have donated money for uh, to rain for the Rape and Incest National Network. And then Yoga Gives Back is one that I, I do a lot of, you know, challenges and just donation work for because I really believe in their mission of giving education grants and microloans to India, you know, in a literal way so that yogis can give back to India, I think is really powerful. 
Wow, those are powerful. Service, service, service. Just just helping others. And I totally agree. Yoga challenges are, I mean, they inspire. I, I remember early Instagram. I think before I was in, even on Instagram, I think I was just on Facebook. Like, I heard of your challenges. And, like, they they were, like, really, like, well organized. And, like, those were, like, the yoga challenges. And then when I started like when I actually got on Instagram, I think this was like 2015, 2016. I saw people doing yoga challenges. It was my friend. She was doing a yoga challenge for her studio and she was doing yoga poses like on her kitchen table and on her bed and like in random places. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like I, I thought it was funny, but I'm like, what are these yogis doing? Like she's doing yeah, Ukatasana on her table. And so I, I get and that's, that's what, Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like cooking pizza in the oven and then boom, right here, <laughs> Trikonasana. <laughs> and that uh, that inspired me to actually create my Namaste AF account because I wanted to just make fun of yoga. I didn't have a yoga practice at the time. I, I think I took Bikram once or twice and, and, and died. took some Kundalini class. Yeah, and, and died because I'm in Phoenix. And it's, it's too hot here. So I I created that account just to make fun of yoga. I started doing like yoga poses in random places and just making up, making up the yoga pose name. And <laughs> then I ended up doing a challenge with, with, um, you know, a company that they wanted to do a challenge. So I did it. And then I'm like, I don't, I have no clue how to do yoga. So I got a yoga teacher to help me out. And then we did a challenge. And then I'm like, I better learn yoga if I'm going to be doing this yoga page. So then I went to a studio and yoga took me. It's like the yoga, you practice yoga, no matter if you start an Instagram doing a challenge or making fun of it. And if you have a <laughs> yoga practice, yoga is going to take you. Yeah. yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> I love that. That's kind of karma, huh? Like, karma. Oh, yeah. Oh, the <laughs> karma. Like, you know, let me make fun of it. Now I'm it. <laughs> yeah, now I am it. No, yeah, now it's like, yeah, it's my whole practice in life, and it's helped me out so much. And I was watching your YouTube channel, and your intro video for your channel is amazing. It said something in there that really touched me. It said something like, you can determine the strength of your practice by, like, the difficult times. Mm -hmm. And that was just like, boom. Because... When I go to the studio when I'm practicing or, or you know, when, when I'm feeling good, yeah, it's, of course, like my practice or my mental practice, my meditation's going well. But it's like sitting in traffic or when things aren't going my way. That's the true test if my practice is you know, really working. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we've got sort of the everyday annoyances, you know, hailstorms and traffic and, you know, canceled flights. But then we've got like, you know, big life challenges, like when we face grief and loss, the death of a loved one, if we get laid off from a job, if there's financial loss, if there's devastating environmental conditions like hurricanes or other environmental disasters, or if we're survivors of trauma or that, you know, we're victims of, of, of you know, of, of, of adult trauma, then these are all things that the spiritual path, the yoga, the, the yoga practice really prepares us to face those times, you know, with, with more grace, with more resilience, you know, we might not be perfect. We'll probably still get angry and depressed and have those moments. But the idea is resilience. The idea is that when you stumble, you'll be able to pick yourself back up and learn from it. When, you know, when there's great loss, there'll be a sense of a, a sort of even amidst the tears and even amidst sort of the heartbreak, there'll be a sense of like a bigger picture that you can zoom out and tune into and kind of tap into. And I can say just for in my own struggles in life that had I not been yoga practitioner and a long-term meditator, I, there are so many situations that probably would have just pulled me under into you know, a, a cycle of depression that I don't know if I would have gotten out from. And so I've really, really, you know, the grace that is accessed through the spiritual path to thank for the resilience that I do have. Yeah, and that is so powerful in terms of the, you know, the, the practice and mental health. I mean, with Instagram, social media, like I have to check myself mentally also, like taking time, taking time for self-care and, you know, taking time for that meditation practice or that yoga practice. Like what is your go-to like when, when times are tough or you're really frustrated like what's your like number one tool or 
that, that you can go to? Like, is it the breath or? Uh, usually it's the meditation. So, you know, whether it's, I would say breath awareness, because that's that simple anchor that's the beginning of calming the mind meditation called Anapana meditation in the Vipassana tradition and Shamatha meditation in the, uh, the, the, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And then we have the idea that just to bring the mind back to the breath, back to the breath, back to the breath, so that mm -hmm. you become cognizant of what the natural state of the breath is. That's a window into the emotional body, the subconscious mind. And then, you know, and then another, something that I find requires an immense amount of discipline is to choose in the moment that there's a trigger, particularly if that trigger is also um, accompanied by desire, control, mm -hmm want you know something like that so if you're if you're annoyed angry and you know or irritated or somehow bothered by something and that is accompanied by a desire to impact change a desire to control the outcome or or some other some other particularly you know particular desire um, that you want someone to say something in a particular way whenever I feel that my my discipline is disengaged take no further action. I have failed at that so many times, <laughs> but <laughs> I, Same. You know, we all have, right? yeah. everybody. Has. Yeah. No, so I, I feel like that's really, really important because as soon as you've taken the bait, you know, you can be lost for a week, a month, a year oh. and like lost in yeah. just like running and doing and running and doing. And like, I'm annoyed at this. And then like, let's like, then you'll find other people that are annoyed also about that. And then you'll act on that anger. And then you'll try to force the, you know, force the other people that you're angry at to give you a particular response. Then you'll be back and forth and back and forth. And I mean, this plays out in relationships and it also plays out kind of in larger scale communal actions. And like my, uh, this is through, you know, through hard learning, whether I'm, you know, whether I find myself triggered in a conversation with someone strongly try to do is just bring my attention to the breath, disengage, and you know, try to remove myself from the situation until I'm calm and clear. And when I do that, my actions are aligned with the truth of who I am. And when I don't do that, my actions are aligned with all of the negative behavioral patterning that I want desperately to change. Yeah. And you can't, it's like trying to force something to make it change. You just, it's not how it works. You know, it's not how it works. I had a little uncomfortable situation yesterday that was self-inflicted. Um, I was in a setting. Okay. So I, I don't drink coffee. So yesterday I'm in a, I'm in a setting with a, a bunch of people and I, I drink some coffee and, um, all of a sudden I get this wave of like anxiety. Right. And I'm like, Oh shit. I got to get out of here. <laughs> like I got to get out of here right now. Yeah. But the reality, the reality, like this was a self-inflicted uncomfortable situation that I had to face the tiger of my own self in this moment. So it's a little bit different than we just talked about, but, but it resonates with me because it's like when something gets uncomfortable, you have to go back to the breathing. You have to go back to yourself and that space within you to know that you can get it together and that like to not feed the tiger, you know, mm -hmm. like don't feed the tiger with, ne with fear and negativity or whatever it is, but come back to yourself and then act from a place of compassion and kindness. And that goes way farther and will be way better for your mental state than if you were just to like react immediately with something that's lashing out, you know? Mm -hmm. So for myself, when I had this coffee, I'm in this setting, I can't go anywhere. I feel like I'm trapped. I'm like, shit, I drop back in. I took myself back to Maya Tulum at a Temascal when I sat in there and there was nowhere to go. Yeah, like, there's nowhere to go in the sweat lodge. And I was like, if I could sit through the sweat lodge, I could sit through this like five minutes of uncomfortable caffeine, you know, I'll be okay in a minute. And then, you know, it passes once you just go back to that centered grounded state. I felt way clearer. <laughs> so I, I think maybe I just had to get that anxiety out of my body. So thanks for letting me just sh share that shit and get it out of here. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. How many moments <laughs> things like that though? The fact that you were conscious of it, they were able to feel yeah. it and then able to kind of take time to return to your center is, is, is the, is the whole purpose of why we practice yoga, you know, They're, exactly. Yeah, you know, that it's really, that's like, that's the work that shows up, you know, whether we yep. end up with our legs behind our head or doing a handstand is really necessary <laughs> to that, you know? That's right. Like, or breathing like, or breathing from coffee, you know? Right. Yeah. I don't drink coffee. Either, so I really, no. I really understand. Don't worry. 
one of the reasons I don't drink coffee is whenever I drink it, it gives me heart palpitations. And that's I, what I was I, feeling. That, yeah, that's what I was feeling. My and my mental, like the mental speed is so yeah. rapid so that the the thoughts to do this rapid fire kind of proliferation thing, my breathing gets yeah. accelerated. And then I, I can't sleep that night, you know, it disturbs my, my no. rhythms. And so I'm just, it's not for me. She, I also don't no, like, same. and I don't like, I, you know, I, I enjoy the smell of coffee when other people are drinking it, but uh, that's it. I think you just uh, described my life. <laughs> I'm going to quit coffee because that's like every, <laughs> everything I've been feeling every day. Is what you, you both have been saying. That's my problem. <laughs> and I just had some coffee this morning. It's the I'm like, coffee, oh, palpitations. Bro. Yep, uh, daily. <laughs> no, but um, it's it's like what both of you said is yes, yes. Um, I for for me, I struggle with anxiety. We just figured out why. It's the coffee. But um, <laughs> like yoga, yoga has been helping me out, but. Just teaching, I, I have a nine-year-old, and like I bring him with me to my practice. Uh, you know, if, if I can't find a babysitter, like he comes with me to the practice. I make sure the studio like will allow, you know, a, a child to come in because he can sit through, he can do yoga. Um, but there was one instance where he was, like, he had anxiety. You know, it wasn't in the yoga studio, but he was before bed. He had anxiety, and I, I just asked him to come back to the present moment. I was like, are you fine right now? He's like, yes. I'm like, let's go through a gratitude list, you know? And just coming back to that present moment, being like, okay, like, right now we're okay, you know? Like, maybe in the future something might happen. Like, we don't know. We don't know the future, or, you know? But right now, are you okay? And I, I, I personally have to come back to that. So it's like, you know, being the teacher, like, that's when I really learn sometimes, you know, especially, like, bringing the yoga yeah. practice to the family. It's like, yeah. When, I'm, when I get anxious, yeah. it's like, okay, I have my breath. I'm okay. I'm physically okay right now. You know, if I'm, if I'm, like, worried about a disease or something in the future, like, we all have, like, fears like that. It's like, no, I'm okay right now. I got a breath. I got water. You know, just going through that gratitude list. And then it's like, oh, it is okay right now. Everything is okay. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's this, there's a couple of ideas that we can think about with that, which is that if you, if you, if you do that, that, that sort of gratitude practice of think of three things that you're grateful for, it, it, oh. it changes the neurobiology of the brain for that moment, because then you're, you know, you're firing and wiring gratitude rather than going into the, the, those sort of familiar repetitive anxiety programs. And at the very least in the moments that you're thankful, you're not projecting and creating an image of sort of the horrible future that you're afraid of. So, and it's like, you can do it at any moment, just like, okay, three things you're grateful for. And you know, just look around and there's always, there's always some little thing that you can find and be like, yeah. Yeah, I'm grateful for the heater. I'm grateful for the internet. I'm grateful for, you know, clean water yeah. or something like that. It can be really, really powerful. So there's that. And then there's this idea of being able to understand that so much of our anxiety is actually rooted in the past and even though we're thinking that it's about the future, so much of our anxiety is rooted in uh, in, in, in a in a past programmed, usually small trauma, small T trauma or capital T trauma, something that's happened that's kind of planted a seed that we haven't been able to release. And so there's a sort of a program that's running that's kind of basically telling us that the future will be the same as the past. And our, this is our anxiety is like, no, we didn't like the past, so we don't want the future to be like that. You know, so so then it's this kind of spiral of the very the past that we're fighting against and fearful of and the past that's wounded us is is actually creating the predictable future. So it's bringing us forward to sort of recreate that very thing that we want desperately to escape from and it's only in the present where we're neither you know rehashing the past and we're not projecting into the future if we can get into the present truly into the present and whether that's through the tool of breath or whether it's occupying the mind with all the different shapes of asana or whether you know it's through waiting it out in a long sit whether that sit is an hour or it is like 10 days, but being able to get the mind to just come to the present and let go, stop telling those stories of the past, stop rehashing the past, stop projecting into the future based on the past to create this time, this closed time circuit that just 
kind of keeps you locked in the same vibration, the same experience, even though maybe the places and the names change. And if, you know, this, yeah. this whole, coming back to the present, coming back to the present, but how do we do that? Not intellectually, but embodied so that it, it's, it's the subconscious mind that comes into the present as well. And that's, you know, that's, again, that's the power of yoga combined with the meditative state so that we're simultaneously working with the quality of thoughts. We're working with breath, which is, you know, the, the connection between the conscious and subconscious mind. We're working with the body, which is really the subconscious mind. And then, you know, we can experience these whole states of, of, of presence because sometimes we're present, but we're present consciously, but the subconscious mind is still working on that, you know, repetitive program caught in the projecting those images of the future. So we want whole consciousness present. Yeah. Cause you just, you get caught in that gnarly, that gnarly shit in the subconscious. And it's like, wait a minute, like I want to be like, I'm physically right here and I want to be right here. So like how do, like I need just, I'm gonna be right here and it just it comes with practice you know and it really is a practice that's where the yoga is working I mean that's kind of been like the hitting home point of this call is like of this conversation has been like presence you know I really feel that service and presence you know and of course gratitude because this show we're all about yoga mindfulness and gratitude with a touch of humor which we definitely have had but uh the grateful when you said list three things that you're grateful for i actually share that exact quote um and i have my students do it sometimes in a practice if the energy is there for whatever reason if we come to like a i don't know like a, a tadasana or we come to like uh you know right before savasana or something like that you know something simple that you can take with you like a little jewel like oh my like it's something like you said like a heater you know well, i'm in i'm in boca raton so i don't need any heaters but air you're in copenhagen <laughs> yeah you know i got the air conditioner yeah. but i i feel you on <laughs> you know just three things water family yoga whatever it is you know just those three things can really really go um a long long way so Thank you for sharing that and reminding me of that. How special that the gratitude list, Brian, that you mentioned, like how special gratitude it, it is because it really is. Yeah, and when I started my meditation practice back in February, that is something that I committed to as well. I get up. That was the first thing I do is I write a gratitude list and I just go through everything. And I didn't feel anything at first, but it was like 60 days, like it clicked. I was in traffic and was getting frustrated like the, my morning wasn't going well and then I just came back to that gratitude I'm like well you know I'm, I'm alive I have, I have my coffee that's making me <laughs> anxious <laughs> <laughs> I, I have uh you know I'm, go- I'm going to work you know so I got a job I got money so just I could see it changing like my mind my subconscious like you're talking about subconscious because I read something lately that like 0.0004, something small is like actually your conscious, what you're doing. And mm-hmm. then the rest very, is your subconscious. Small. Like that's the computer program. Mm-hmm. It's making stuff happen. Yeah. The operating system that's constantly running and running its programs. And we haven't been conscious creators of what those programs are. So we're unwittingly, you know, perpetuating our, you know, our, our most traumatic incidents from the past, as well as being the recipients of thousands of years of just human civilization. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. It's right. It's like I was reading a, um, a part of the Four Agreements yesterday, and it was talking about the dream of – have you read the Four Agreements, either of you? Yeah, I have not. wonderful book. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's talking about like the dream of the, you know, I've read it a few times, but, I, um, but Summer and I, Summer's my wife, we've committed to reading um, one or two pages a day of a book together. And I mean, if we get more, great, but sometimes at the end of the day with three kids, like it's really hard to like have energy to read a lot more than that and stay awake and conscious of what you're actually reading, especially the four agreements, because it's a little bit deep. But it was talking about like the dream of the planet and how like everybody's has these dreams, you know, like there's this dream in your subconscious or something that maybe you're, that you were born with, like your birthright. But you know, when you come out, like everyone's telling you, like, this is what you have to do, or this is how you do it. Or I mean, this, everybody is just conditioned from somebody else's experience. You know, that's what we all are. It's human conditioning. I know it just really made me think about like, what is my dream? And like, what do I want to do? And like the subconscious programming, these, all these things that people say you can or can't do, like, like the word is like, if I want to do it, I can like, just make like put it out to the universe and allow for the the universe to open the doors where there were once walls and just let it happen you know and for be me. willing to put in the work you know be willing to put in the work yeah put the yeah. work in absolutely like just put the head put the head in the books bring your hard hat and your lunch pail and like go do it 
You know, just do yeah. it. Don't let anybody tell you other. And if someone's, and that's where like the that's where you level up in your vibration. And some of the people that don't resonate with like, well, like I like they said that you couldn't do it. The naysayers, like if they were your friend or they, someone that's just unsupportive, like that's where when you level up and like, then you make a new group of friends who are on that vibration, or a new group of surrounding people that are there to support you, and you just keep evolving and growing. You know, on the path. You know that you're working yeah. on. Yeah. And this is a really, it's a really interesting thing to be on that constant path of, of, of growth and evolution because not everyone is. And so, mm-hmm. you know, there, there are people that will, that if you are committed to that, there are some really radical shifts that can sometimes happen and, you know, whole, whole old groups of friends, old groups of, of a community or something like that just go might not. Away. Yeah. They, it might not be appropriate. I've had that happen so many times so yeah. that. Like, I feel that there are people that I'll always have love for in my heart, but are just not in my circle anymore. And I'm just a different person. And sometimes I'll interact with them and they'll, you know, they'll speak to me as though I'm that other person. And I can just really feel like, <sighs> oh, yeah, I'm not that person anymore. Like, thanks for that I'm mirror. Yeah. yeah. And then the other, I, the other interesting thing, though, about that dream of the planet from the Four Agreements from, you know, the Don mm-hmm. Miguel Ruiz book is, um, is, is the dream of the planet is something that I really feel it needs to be updated. You know, this is like a massive update that like we need to have. And I think that this is perhaps what everybody who's incarnated right now, that's practicing yoga, that's interested in that. There's so many people that are like questioning the dream of the planet right now. And that question is amazing. You know, it's it's the potential for growth, the potential for kind of an inner revolution. And, you know, the feel the more people practice yoga, the more people that are meditating, the more, greater potential there is for that dream of the planet to be updated you know yeah. and you're and the thing to remember is that hey you're a yoga practitioner you're you're a meditator you're sitting at home you're doing your you know gratitude list you're doing your you know yoga poses you're focusing on breath you're doing your best to heal your own trauma and when you do that you are contributing to an updated dream of the planet you really mm-hmm. are Something I think mm-hmm. everybody needs to remember because, hey, as you said, you know, like life is busy. You have, you know, three kids and, you know, a podcast and uh, other, you know, a whole like, life to exist with. And so, it's oh like, my okay. gosh, yeah. Yeah, you might feel guilty, like, oh, I'm not like, you know, as polit- politically active as I should be. I'm not doing enough, you know, charity work. But it's like, wait a minute, you're practicing yoga right. every day. You are mm-hmm. doing your work to impact change in that dream of the planet you're working on uh, like like realms of interconnection in you know in the in the energy field around you and in the city that you're in you're making a difference even if you're not drawn into you know active forms of resistance or protest or something like that but if you are of course like do your work and become an awakened activist yes wow that was so i was getting chills when you were that was a super powerful <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that i literally right. have chills right now yeah. you know wow all right Kino. well we 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 don't want to take too much more of your time we know you have a crazy busy schedule over there in copenhagen but we have this thing that we do on this yogi show called the hashtag lighten up round okay where we ask random questions while we call them wild card questions especially on a wednesday it's wild, wild card, card wednesday, wednesday. <laughs> so, it's something new we just made yeah wild card wednesday something new we just made that up. my so summer and i we, we say wild card wednesday because it's like the break in our uh, workout and like yoga schedule like where you can just do a wild card of like whatever you want to do for that morning workout like maybe you want to sleep in and that's your workout or maybe you're doing a you know a, a more restorative practice but <laughs> we're calling it wild card wednesday today on the yogi show for the uh, lighten up round so keto they're just uh random fun questions and don't think about it too hard. And uh, it'll just be a couple a couple fun questions. Okay. Ready for it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go first and then we'll have Wildcard Brian uh, go after that. So, Kino, <laughs> who would you rather take a yoga class from, Woody or Buzz Lightyear? I could have to say Woody. <laughs> Woody. Ah, I was going Buzz Lightyear yeah, to I infinity thought, and beyond. Be like, Lightyear. that was my. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. I really know who those two were, so I just chose one. <laughs> <laughs> from, to- from Toy Story. <laughs> from Toy Story. From the Toy Story movie. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. All, 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 good, all, all good, good. All good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the lighting up round. So can't, can't be right, up can't be wrong. Goes. So ne- next question. <laughs> where would you build a yoga like studio? Oh, okay. <laughs> <I was> like- <laughs> This is why this is amazing. <laughs> All right. So where would you build a yoga studio, Mars or the moon? Probably the moon. 
the moon. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going, going to the moon, moon too, too, for sure. My my last name is Luna, oh. so I'm definitely on the moon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm already I'm already on the moon. Kino, um, preference to practice sunset beach yoga or sunrise beach yoga? Sunrise beach yoga. Mm. Is it only because we live in Miami or, you know, in South Florida and we get the sunrise or have you done sunset too? The sunset can be beautiful, you know, but the like, the sunrise I feel is like... It's magical. Be, it's magical. There's less people. Yes. There's like this promise of a new day. Yeah, I mean, my quiet. My friend is an island where you get both. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I have this dream, uh, real quick before we continue with the light. I had this dream of doing um, summer and I want to do sunrise class on the beach here on East, then drive over to like Naples and do a sunset class on the beach over there. Like we're, yeah. we're going to make that happen. Yeah, we're going to do that. So go to the key. Fun It'll stuff. be next to the drive. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like two hours. Not bad. You know, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> Brian, what you got? What type of yoga do you think? Sasquatch, aka Bigfoot, would practice what type of yoga? <laughs> I'm gonna say that the Sasquatch <laughs> would probably be practicing some sort of power yoga, uh, so that yeah. it could. Oh. So that Sasquatch oh. could be like really strong and stomp around out in the wilderness, and you know, lift yeah. logs and other things that Sasquatch is <laughs> doing. Probably a lot of handstands, you think? Arm balance. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. <laughs> I don't those feet over his head. I'm not. Can he lift those feet into the air? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, so fun. Um, Kino, thank you so much for taking the time. That that completes the the hashtag lighten up round for this beautiful wild card Wednesday. Um, uh, from Copenhagen, from Boca Raton, and from Phoenix. It's been a super pleasure to connect with you and um, for you to share a little bit of your story and all of your amazing insight and insight and wisdom. We have so much gratitude for you taking the time to be here. And I know the listeners are for sure forever grateful for you, uh, for you being able to share this experience with us because it's been a lot of fun and uh, super valuable. So thank you. Oh, and thank, thank you both for having me. It's been a lovely time. And thanks, everyone, uh, for listening. And I just really hope everyone stays inspired to keep practicing. Yeah, that's the mission, man. That's keep the mission. practicing. Brian? Keep practicing, everybody, because if you practice yoga, the universe will take care of the rest. That's right, man. Get out of your own way. You know, just get out of your own way. So we'll make sure to link all of the uh, notes and details back on the yogishow.com, everywhere you can find chemo, Kino. A chemo. What the heck? Brian, yeah, take that cut. out of the podcast. <laughs> Brian's the producer. He can delete that part. You can delete that part. Uh, where you can find Kino at and uh, about Ohm Stars and all the incredible messages that she shares um, on her blog. Because your blog is inspiring as hell. So thank you for making that, that, doing that blog. Like, it is really inspiring. Thank you. So with that being, with that being said, we're going to sign off, my friends. So thanks, Kino, for being here. And namaste. We will see you on the other side, my friends. Namaste. 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 Thank you so much for listening to the Yogi Show podcast. Tell all your friends, tell your family, tell your yoga studio, subscribe to the podcast, leave a comment, leave a review. We would appreciate that. Thank you, Kino McGregor, for coming on the show. Visit omstars.com. Use the code Yogi Show, all caps. That'll get you 30 days. Omstar.com, Yogi Show. And I know you're waiting for the trivia question answer. I know you're waiting for it. So let's give you the answer here. So the question was, what's the largest island in the world? What is the largest island in the world? I hope you didn't Google it. I hope you didn't check your phone, your yogis. I trust you. But the largest island in the world is Greenland. Greenland is the largest island in the world. And another fun fact is most of Greenland is ice. So I'm not sure there's any hot yoga in Greenland, but if there is hot yoga, let us know. Let us know. But yeah, thank you so much for listening to this show. Visit theyogishow.com. All the show notes are there. Special thanks to DJ Taz Rashid for providing the music on the Yogi Show today. We appreciate you. And remember... Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Namaste, my friends.